In this EcoWest presentation, we explain how an excess of fuels in some Western ecosystems is making wildfires worse and discuss some possible solutions. Three basic factors determine a wildfire's behavior. There's the weather, the temperature, humidity, and wind at the moment, plus the climatic conditions over the preceding months and years. There's the topography, the presence of drafty canyons, south-facing slopes exposed to the desiccating sun, or other features that would encourage burning. And there's the fuel, the type of vegetation, its volume, its moisture content, and its continuity on the landscape. No one can do anything about the weather or the topography. Treating the fuel is the only way to make wildfires more manageable and decrease the risk to both human communities and forest habitat. Wildfires are a natural part of many western ecosystems, but the risk of wildfires varies greatly from place to place. In some regions, such as the California desert, there isn't much fuel to burn, though some parts of the southwest are being invaded by non-native grasses that are flammable. Aside from the west and Alaska, states in the south are most likely to burn. It's important to remember that western forests, woodlands, and grasslands vary greatly in their natural fire regimes. In some, wildfires used to be a frequent visitor, returning every few years, while others would burn every few centuries in big, stand-replacing blazes. Let's take a closer look at the west. Many parts of the region have a high or very high potential. Hot spots include the Southern California coastal ranges, the Great Basin, the Central and Southern Rockies, and the mountains of the Southwest. White depicts areas where there isn't enough fuel to burn, such as the deserts of Southern California, Southern Nevada, and Western Arizona. But in parts of the Southwest, invasive, non-native grasses are spreading and creating a fire risk where there was none before. There are also some white areas in the Rockies that depict areas above treeline where there is no fuel to burn. Fire is essential to the health of western forests, but for more than a century we have been fighting blazes to protect lives, home, timber, and other resources. The policy was epitomized by Smokey Bear, who helped Americans adopt a negative attitude toward wildfires. But the result of fire suppression was a tremendous buildup of fuel in many western forests. Areas that once burned with low-intensity ground fires every few years now went decades without seeing any flames. To understand the issue, it's critical to go back in time. Western forests have undergone some dramatic changes over the past century. Logging and other human activities have certainly led to the outright loss of some forested areas, but even places that have escaped chainsaws and bulldozers have changed in character. This sequence of images shows how one spot in the Bitterroot National Forest in Montana changed from 1909 to 1948 to 1989. Fire suppression has caused a proliferation of smaller trees and other fuel that can allow wildfires to burn very intensely and reach into the canopy. In some areas, such as the ponderosa pine forests around the drier parts of the interior west, frequent low-intensity burns used to visit the woods, sparked by lightning or set by Native Americans, and clear out the underbrush. But in other forests, such as the lodgepole pines of the Rockies, infrequent high-intensity burns were the norm. This map shows the condition of natural fire systems by terrestrial ecoregion. Green indicates where the natural fire regime is more or less intact, pink shows degraded areas, and orange depicts very degraded areas. In the United States, the coastal mountains of northern California, Oregon, and Washington, and parts of the central and northern Rockies still have intact fire systems but many parts of the Intermountain West, as well as the Southeast and Great Lakes region, have degraded conditions. This map uses a three-category system for describing fire regimes. Red indicates areas where wildfires may be significantly altered from their historic behavior. Yellow shows areas that are moderately altered from historic conditions, and green marks where conditions are near historical norms. Because many forests and woodlands have too much fuel due to fire suppression, the government has been trying to step up its thinning on federal lands. This graphic distinguishes between a couple of different types of fuel treatments. 
The first distinction is between activity taking place within and beyond the wildland urban interface. Known by its acronym, the WUI is where property and residents are most at risk of wildfires, although the definition is somewhat contested. The fuel's treatment primarily consists of thinning with chainsaws, or mechanical treatments, and prescribed burns, or fire. The total acreage has been climbing in recent years, but it's important to remember that these treatments are just a drop in the bucket. By some estimates, there are 190 million acres of federal lands at elevated risk for wildfires. Prescribed fires are an important tool for reducing excess fuels. On a per acre basis, they are less expensive than mechanical thinning projects, and they can do tremendous good for forest ecosystems by reintroducing fire to where it is natural. But conditions have to be just right to set a prescribed fire so that it doesn't turn into a disastrous wildfire. That's happened occasionally in the West, such as the 2000 Cerro Grande fire in Los Alamos, New Mexico. And many in the public remain skeptical or outright opposed to prescribed fires because of the risks and the smoke. This graphic shows that the number of acres burned in prescribed fires has generally been increasing over the past dozen years. Most of the burns happen on Forest Service land. The federal government used to report on instances of wildland fire use, essentially letting wildfires burn rather than suppressing them. This strategy, meant to consume excess fuel and restore the natural fire regime, is still practiced today, but the government stopped reporting that statistic in 2008. This graphic shows the number of wildland fire use acres in the preceding decade. Most of the activity took place on Forest Service lands, but the National Park Service also allowed a fair amount of acreage to burn. You can download more slides and other resources at ecowest.org.